Now we're going to look at Ezra through Esther. Uh, I titled this Rebuilding and Surviving. Uh, this is what's going on in the latter portion of the historical record for the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, children of Israel at that time. Uh, before the 400 years, uh, the intertestamental period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, these are the things which uh, lead up to that por portion. And so first we're going to look at Ezra and Nehemiah. Sometimes these are taken as one book, uh, much like First and Second Samuel or First and Second Kings or First and Second Chronicles. These two books uh, are sometimes housed together. And so let's look at the content of them. Uh, you have in Ezra, you have uh, to rebuild the temple, that's the goal, and then to reestablish ethnic identity. That's why often uh, you, you might see, well, this book is written at this period of time to speak uh, for or against uh, marriage of foreign women. That's sometimes the discussion of Ruth. Uh, Ruth is a foreign woman. And, and so there are some who make the argument that Ruth is written during this period of time, uh, the, the post-exilic rebuilding of the temple, as an argument against the reforms that Ezra and Nehemiah are putting in place to reestablish ethnic identity. Um, so consider those things. Uh, I don't, I don't I really hold on to the validity of some of these arguments. Uh, but in Old Testament studies, you're going to come across these ideas and you're just going to have to to deal with them in the best way that you see fit. And it, to purify the Jewish people. And so they're saying, no more of this intermarriage. Uh, no more of this marrying foreign women, uh, men, or, you know, women marrying foreign men, but of course uh, the former is more prevalent than the latter. Uh, and, and really in the leadership, that was a huge situation with particularly Solomon and all that went on with, with him. And so we're going to reestablish an ethnic identity to purify the Jewish people and then some of the themes that go along in Nehemiah is the rebuilding of the walls. And then uh, the likely uh, the forerunner to Ezra's efforts to promote the Torah and reintroduce temple sacrifice. So what they're saying is the walls being necessarily built first and then uh, all these things, once they're established, uh, Ezra comes in and uh, really as a priest or Ezra the scribe, he is trying to uh, deal with the temple and the people. And then Nehemiah is really trying to deal with the infrastructure and, and all that goes along with that in those contexts. So keep those things in mind as you read in the book of Nehemiah and all that goes along in Nehemiah. Of course, in the middle of the book of Nehemiah, you have Nehemiah 8, which is a wonderful picture of worship. And Ezra reads from the book of the law. Uh, they've established all the walls and the gates, and now here comes Ezra with the, with the law of God, and the people have such a hunger because you have people who have come out of exile, and they've really never even, you know, some of them, some generations, have never even heard from the book of the law and as we read it, and all the people were reverent. And um, so I believe in your readings is as, as uh, Nehemiah eight is uh, one of the things I had you read. So when you think about authorship and date, uh, originally two books likely edited as two volume 
books by Ezra. And so Ezra being the scribe, so the idea uh, by some is that it's two books likely edited as a two volume. So it will be where you could put those two together. They work in tandem, uh, much like in the New Testament. Uh, New Testament, Luke and Acts. Essentially, Acts is a second volume to what Luke wrote. Luke writes those things concerning Jesus, which is the Gospel of Luke, and then he writes those things concerning the early church, giving an orderly account of all that took took place. And so that would those would be considered um, two books, but really two volumes. And then we, you find historical material of Nehemiah is previous to Esther, uh, Ezra, excuse me, but the book of Ezra and Nehemiah's corpus uh, reflects Ezra's contribution to the books. So the uniting of the two reflects that Ezra had a part in, in it and the material within it points to Ezra. Uh, beginning material of Ezra is linked to the concluding material of the book of Chronicles. So that's why you have it as Ezra, Nehemiah in the canon. Ezra coming before Nehemiah because it lines up with material at the end of the book of Chronicles. And then it is thought that it was finish it being these two books sometime after 33 433 BC so it puts it you know 33 years before the intertestamental period begins and so you can see this is the end of the canon as far as historical narrative is concerned all these things coming to an end, coming to a completion. Then you see the genre and structure. Uh, it's a historical review in Ezra 1 through 6. You have Ezra's memoirs, part 1, and the latter part of Ezra, chapter 7 through 10. You have Nehemiah's memoirs, part 1, uh, through Nehemiah. One seven, then you have Ezra's memoirs, part two, through eight and ten of Nehemiah, and then part two of Nehemiah's memoirs through the end of the book of Nehemiah. So this is how they're divided out structurally. Then you have Ezra and Nehemiah as part of the, the theological history of Israel as a memoir. They are writing as to what took place at the end of the post-exilic period and how uh, Jerusalem and the nation, the people, came back and rebuilt uh, what was destroyed previously. Uh, and then it's written from a pers personal, subjective view. Uh, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, now let's talk about Esther. Uh, Esther, the end of the historical narrative portion of the Bible. Uh, the chief thing to remember about Esther, and if uh, you probably already know it, if you don't, uh, well, here it is. God is not mentioned at all in the book of Esther. Now, sometimes some people think, well, uh, um, you know, God is not mentioned in the book of Ruth, uh, but, but the name of God is mentioned in the book of Ruth uh, in Ruth's conversation with Naomi. It is mentioned, but not once. Is it mentioned in Esther? And Esther really is a, a powerful so story. You have the story is set during the reign of the Persian king 
uh, Asarius, and this is Greek uh, for Xerxes. And so Xerxes is usually um, usually the name that is often used here. Um, and then Xerxes uh, is also, you know, that Persian king is also used in other historical context. Uh, his, his name is even used in contemporary movies set in that time as well. So it's a well-known king historically. Uh, you have two main characters, that is Ezra and Mordecai, and they are cousins. And then you have an incident uh, of, the, of the book, uh, inciting incident of the book of, uh, is Vashti's refusal to appear before the crowds And this offends uh, Xerxes, and he disposes of her and requests for a new queen. So this begins this um, this begins this uh, maneuvering. Uh, you could say providence of God working here in that queen. Vashti refuses to come uh, on request of the king, and then the king gets rid of her, opening the door for um, Esther. So Esther is found to be the most attractive of the potential wives. Meanwhile, Mordecai foils an assassination plot against the king. Uh, the antagonist in this case is Haman, and he appears as a slighted official in the Persian court. If Haman, he's an Amalekite from the line of Agag, uh, so he hates the Jewish people. He hates the Jews. At this point, no one knows that Esther is Jewish, uh, except for Mordecai, who is her cousin. Uh, but or Mordecai is a Benjamite uh, from the line of Kish. So he's part of the Benjamin, tribe of Benjamin. Um, and then there's a rivalry that ensues between Haman and Mordecai, resulting in a series of Ironic terms of fate. Um, Haman plots to destroy the Israelites through the Purim or lots. And then, however, the Persian king allows the Israelites to arm themselves for the attack. And then, in the big ironic twist, Haman sharpens a pole. And he's going to impale Mordecai on it. However, when the king learns of the plot, he orders Haman to be impaled on it. So Haman is going to use it to impale Mordecai, but the king uses it to impale Haman. Uh, the king in this story is portrayed as kind of a bumbling drunk. Uh, just out of it, out of sorts. And so Esther and Mordecai are able to maneuver and do what they need to do in order to save their people. Uh, but Haman wishes to be honored by the king. Uh, Mordecai ends up being honored. And so there's a twist of fate that takes place. Whereas Haman wanted to impale Mordecai and be honored by the king, but... Um, Haman ends up impaled, dishonored by the king, and Mordecai ends up being honored by the king. Uh, these are major themes, that is divine sovereignty. God is at work, even though the name of God is missing from the Hebrew edition. But silent providence is pervasive, meaning that God's name may not appear in the text. 
However, it is hard to deny that God is not at work in this situation. Uh, then there's ancient rivalries. Uh, Mordecai and Haman resolve the earlier uh, affair or situation, rivalry uh, between Saul and Agag. The author is anonymous. It is thought that we do not know exactly who. It is often read at the Purim uh, during Adar, that is uh, February or March of the year. Along with the Song of Psalms, it's the only book without a reference to Yahweh or God. Um, therefore, Psalms and Esther are disputed books for the Hebrew canon. So, because God is not mentioned in the book of Esther, and also in the book of Song of Songs, sometimes referred to as Song of Solomon, and we'll get to that book later on. Um, they are disputed because they uh, did not uh, use the name of God in the Hebrew editions. There's no reference to Yahweh. Uh, then you have the fact that you have these actual kings. Which king is it <laughs> uh, that is being spoken of here? And that, if it was one of the three, well, that would change the date in which these, this book is written, right? Uh, the story of the rivalry between Saul and Agog, uh, vice versa, is uh, back to that rivalry between Mordecai and Haman. So, looking at the genre, it is historical narrative. It's part of a novella family like Ruth, you have festivals mentioned, you have the festival of Xerxes, the festival of Esther, Esther the festival of the Purim, uh, and again, it is historical narrative in context. Um, hope you learned a good bit. I wanted you to look over those. Thank you for watching this lecture. If you have any questions, please email me, uh, contact me with any concerns or comments that you may have. Hope you have a wonderful day, and thank you for being part of this class.